Part 1. You're going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 10. Hello, Dawn. Oh, hi, Elmer. Glad I've bumped into you. I've just found a great idea for the presentation we've got to do for Dr Banks next month. What, the one on everyday objects? Yes, look at this article. It's really interesting. The aluminium Coke can. You know, Coca-Cola cans, soft drink cans. Look, let's sit down here. Have you got a minute? Sure, I'll just get my bag. OK, so you think we can get a presentation out of this article? I'm sure we can. First of all, we can provide some interesting facts about the aluminium cans that we drink out of every day. Like? Well, here it says that in the US they produce 300 million aluminium cans each day. Wow, 300 million. Exactly. That's an enormous number. It says here, outstrips the production of nails or paper clips. And they say that the manufacturers of these cans exercise as much attention and precision in producing them as aircraft manufacturers do when they make the wing of an aircraft. Really? Let's have a look. They're trying to produce the perfect can, as thin but as strong as possible. Hmm, this bit's interesting. Today's can weighs about 0.48 ounces, thinner than two pieces of paper, from this magazine, say. Yeah, and yet it can take a lot of weight. More than 90 pounds of pressure per square inch. Three times the pressure of a car tyre. OK, I agree. It's a good topic. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. What I thought was that we could do a large picture of a Coke can and label it and then talk about the different parts. Look, I've done a rough picture here. OK, so where shall we start? Well, the lid is complicated. Let's start with the body first. I'll do a line from the centre of the can, like this, and label it body. What does it say? It's made of aluminium, of course. It's thicker at the bottom. Right, so that it can take all the pressure. And then I think you should draw another line from the body for the label. Right, label. The aluminium is ironed out until it's so thin that it produces... What does it say? A reflective surface suitable for decoration. That's right, apparently. It helps advertisers too. Yes, because it's attractively decorated. Good. And then there's the base. Yes. It says the bottom of the can is shaped like a dome so that it can resist the internal pressure. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Nor did I. OK, so going up to the lid, there are several things we can label here. There's the rim around the edge, which seals the can. Got that. And there's a funny word for the seal, isn't there? Yes, it's a flange. What does it say about it? Well, the can's filled with coke, or whatever. And after that, the top of the can is trimmed and then bent over to secure the lid. That's right. It looks like a seam. We could even do a blow-up of it, like this. F. L. A. N. G. E. Yes, that would be clearer. I think we should label the lid itself and say that it constitutes 25% of the total weight. 25%, so it's stronger than the body of the can. So, to save money, the manufacturers make it smaller than the rest of the can. Didn't know that either. So how do we open a can of Coke? Um, first of all, there's the tab, which we pull up to open the can, and that's held in place by a rivet. Um, I think that's too small for us to include. I agree, but we can talk about it in the presentation. We can show the opening, though. That's the bit of the can that drops down into a drink when we pull the tab. Yeah, hopefully. Sometimes the tab just breaks off. I know. Anyway, 
The opening is scored so that it pushes in easily but doesn't detach itself. OK, we can show that by drawing a shadow of it inside the can, like this. I'll label it scored opening. Great. Well, I think we've got the basis of a really interesting presentation. Let's go and photocopy the article. Fine. I'll take it home and study it some more. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a lecture. Before you listen, please look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 11 to 20. Evening everyone. I'd like to make a few announcements before the first performances begin at this year's Hetherington Art and Music Festival. Firstly, a short guide to some of the more important places on the site. There are three stages. Stage 1 is the main stage and this is where I am speaking from now. Stage 2 and 3 are opposite each other to the left and right of the main stage. The first aid post is located directly behind me and to the northeast of the main stage. The organiser's office is next to the rear entrance and this is where lost children can be reunited with their parents. In front of this office you will find 10 public telephones. These telephones can only be used to telephone out. They will not receive incoming calls. Toilets are to be found in all four corners of the stadium site. If you lose anything, you should make a report at the security post next to stage 2. Remember to visit the souvenir stall in the car park in front of the main entrance to the stadium. If you want to leave the stadium for any reason, please remember to keep your ticket with you, as you will not be re-admitted without it. While on this subject, to make exit and re-entry simple, could everyone leaving the site use the main entrance at the other side of the car park, leading to Gladstone Road? This is to allow performers easy access to the site through the rear gate behind the main stage. Most importantly, when leaving the area of the stadium, try to keep as quiet as possible so as not to disturb our neighbours. We have already been warned that we will not be given permission to hold the festival next year if there are complaints from local residents. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions Now that I've got the official announcements out of the way, I'd like to tell you about tonight's programme. The Brazilian drum band will be appearing on stage three at seven o'clock. This is the first time that they have performed outside South America, so their show is not to be missed. This will be followed by Claude and Jacques, who will be introducing special guests from the fields of music and dance. Meanwhile, on stage two, there is a modern ballet from Great Grapefruit Incorporated illustrating women's role in world peace. This will begin at 7 o'clock and last for roughly two hours. Stage one begins at 9 o'clock with jazz fusion band, Frost Wires, whose performance tonight is the last date on their world tour. Stage one continues with a regular guest at these festivals, comedian Tom Gobble. His show begins at 10.30. After Claude and Jacques at 9, on stage three, there will be a performance from the Flying Barito Brothers, who are acrobats with the Albanian State Circus. 
The Barito Brothers' fire-eating trapeze act is unique. No other performer has managed to equal their grand finale. From 11.15, we are happy to present Winston Smiles and the Kinston Beat, who will be playing authentic Jamaican reggae until the end of the official programme at 1.30. On stage two, the great Mr. Ron will be presenting his show of magic illusion and mystery at 9.30. During the show, he will be chained and thrown into a sealed aquarium, from which he will try to escape. If everything goes as planned, the set will finish at 11.30, and the stage will be ready for the country and western music of Bluegrass Ben and the Cattlemen at 12. This act will be the last on stage two tonight. After Tom Gobble on stage one, we have tonight's main attraction, the Prophets who will be performing in public tonight for the first time since they broke up five years ago. The news is that they are back and they will be presenting a show including old favourite songs from their new album, which is to be released in September. They are expected on stage at midnight. After the official programme has ended, there will be a number of sideshows taking place around the site. The end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student called Jerry discussing a pedagogy course with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Jerry, how did it go with preparing your lessons? Is there anything you would like to discuss? Well, this is actually the first time that I have ever taught in an elementary classroom. After eight years of learning pedagogy, I want to practice what I've learned in an instructive manner. But I'm a bit stuck right now. You know the topic I want them to research is a bit hard for pupils. I'm afraid that they won't be able to handle it on their own. So I need new ideas on designing more effective teaching methods. Mr. Carter, do you have any suggestions? Well, you should probably read this book called Professional Learning, written by J.K. Simmons. He is a professor who just transferred here last semester, but is already popular amongst the students for his creative teaching methods. There is an extensive range of learning approaches mentioned in the book, including approaches for team research, which might be helpful to you. You mean dividing the students into groups to do research? I've never thought of this before. How does it work? Professor Simmons has already demonstrated how efficient this approach can be. Basically, it aims to increase cooperation between students so they can present the results in a collaborative fashion. It helps them to develop their own voice and perspective. I'll check out the book as soon as possible. It seems I can borrow some of the essential concepts and work them into my course design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. 
Well, I was thinking maybe I could use both observation and non-observation as a part of my teaching methodology. Could you take a look at my teaching plan? Sure. What kind of observational methods do you have in mind? For the observational part, I intend to include two approaches. First, the pupils can assess each other's behaviour. I feel that reviewing fellow students through criteria-based reference evaluation allows constructive feedback. It can also improve their understanding of the subject material. That's a smart move for a large class that would be hard to observe all by yourself. Also, you might want to get the feedback from several different individuals rather than just one. So how do you plan to carry out the peer assessments? Oh, Every pupil will be required to write a diary, which includes group projects, presentations and in-class discussions. They'll put down their remarks. I'll collect them on a regular basis, which can also help me see whether they can keep up or not. Good. What else do you intend to do? Besides that, I also plan to do video recording. I've already purchased a camera, just in case I miss anything important. I can go back and review their performances any time I want. Would you record every in-class activity? No, I'll just keep track of an in-class simulation which would require every pupil to fully participate. Students will act as members of a city council meeting discussing issues like whether or not prohibition should be instated in the United States. This kind of teaching method is both inspiring and challenging. I can't wait to see how yours works out. Do send me a copy of the assessment afterwards, will you? No problem. So, what do you have in mind for the non-observational approaches? Well, my plan is to quantify the statistics. Numbers do not lie. It is the most direct way to measure their performance. See how well they've learned. Where does the data come from? I'll evaluate the test results, including the midterm, final exam and pop quizzes, which would only take up about 40% of the overall assessment. Sounds like a lot of tests and assignments. Please remember that you don't want to wear out your students. Keeping them engaged is the key to efficient learning. Once they are exhausted, they just stop trying. Oh, I haven't thought about that. You are right. I don't want to frighten them with tons of assignments and exams. I'll make note of that. Thanks for the advice. I remember last time you mentioned questionnaires, right? That's true, but it is not for my students. In fact, they have to design their own questionnaires and choose the respondents using the internet. As a complement of other teaching activities, it would deepen the creative learning process. Is that all? Oh, the pupils will have to conduct interviews of their own. And for this, they get to choose anyone they like, including relatives, friends and acquaintances to answer the questions. Seems to me that you have figured out most of your teaching methods, but you still need to polish some of the activities. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about urban migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, and welcome to my talk on urban migration today. The world has experienced unprecedented urban growth in the recent decade. As much as three percent of Earth's landmass has been urbanized, an increase of at least fifty percent over previous estimates. Today, people living in cities already outnumber those in rural areas, and the trend does not appear to be reversing. In addition, cities have larger amounts of carbon consumption than rural areas. This is a result from two major aspects. First, with the increase of urban population around the world, the massive construction of urban infrastructure and residential housing is hard to avoid. Second, urban households have a higher rate of car ownership and use more gasoline products. Even though rural exodus is often negatively judged, there are also benefits of migration shared by the local environment and the society as a whole. Well, firstly, global trends of increasing urban migration and population urbanization can provide opportunities for nature conservations, particularly in regions where deforestation is driven by agriculture. As rural dwellers leave their homes. Local forests are left to recover. What's more, it is easier for city dwellers to get around. Living in the country means transport can be very difficult. For instance, after midnight, there are no buses or taxis in the countryside. However, there is still a number of public transport modes to choose from in the city. Finally, with more funds and advanced technology, cities endeavor to produce clean energy. New power plants have been built to take harmful methane gas created by the decomposition of rubbish and convert it into electricity. By doing so, an important greenhouse gas is turned into useful energy, rather than being directly emitted into the atmosphere. The hustle and bustle of city life offers women the opportunity to explore different professions and pursue their own careers. Women in cities work as engineers, managers, and even football players. This change of roles has affected their marital status and family life. More women are choosing their careers over marriage, which raises the graph of late marriages. As a result, more are remaining single well into their late thirties. They want to be independent and earn money on their own. It is also easier for them. To get a promotion while working in the city, women are slowly achieving wider participation at work, while in rural areas the mindset is still very conservative. However, cities also change the way that humans interact with each other and the environment, often causing multiple problems. In general, urban wages are significantly higher. So moving to the city is an opportunity to earn what was impossible in rural areas. However, the wage difference is often offset by the higher cost of living and absence of self-produced goods, including substance farming. A sizable proportion of new corners attach greater importance to money, and gradually abandon their former way of life, thus risking losing their culture. These new city residents are also faced with another problem. According to statistics, crime rates are significantly higher in densely populated urban regions than in rural areas. For instance, property crime rates in our metropolitan areas are three to four times as high in comparison to the rates in rural communities. Immigrants, upon arrival into cities, typically move into the poor. Blighted neighborhoods, because that is where they can afford to live. Crime in these areas is high and reflects poor living conditions, as these neighborhoods experience great levels of poverty. This pattern also occurs for violent crimes, which is much more common in large urban areas than elsewhere.
In addition, traffic congestion and industrial manufacturing are prominent features of the urban landscape, which take their toll on the natural environment and those who depend on it. Air pollution from both cars and factory emissions affect the health of countless urban residents. Rural to urban migration can boost the urban economy. With a better economy, cities provide their residents with better welfare. But the concentration of services and facilities, such as education, health, and technology in urban areas, inevitably contributes to greater energy consumption. Another problem with life in the city is traffic congestion. It makes people late to work, and thus stresses us out before we even get there. Deliveries can't arrive on time. Gas costs money. The quality of life of those commuters starts to decline. What's worse is that if congestion makes it harder to match the right workers to the best jobs, it is economically inefficient as well. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.